Hi, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. Um, before we begin, I want to let you know that the session will be recorded. I'm Chris Silva, president of the Taunton Area Chamber of Commerce, and today we are pleased to provide an opportunity for you, the members of our business community, to hear from some of our legislators in what we expect will be a very informative hour. And I want to thank each of them for taking the time to be with us today. We have many questions from uh, for our panelists this morning from our membership. And as we proceed, if you have any follow-up questions, please put them in the chat. Those will come to me and we'll address them uh, if time permits. So first, I'd like to thank the sponsors for today's event. Gold sponsor, the Lopes Companies. Silver sponsors, Bluestone Bank and Bristol County Savings Bank. And our silver sponsors, Bristol Community College and Commonwealth Alternative Care. So now I'd like to invite Debbie Dutra from the Lopes Companies to say a few words. Good morning, Debbie. Good morning, everybody. You can all hear me. <laughs> Uh, my name is Debbie Dutra, and I've been on the chamber board for nine years now, and I also work at the Lopes Companies in Taunton, and we are very excited to be the gold sponsor of today's legislative update. Our company has actually been a member of the chamber for over 25 years, and this has actually been one of my favorite events that the chamber puts on. I remember the good old days holding this event many years at mm -hmm. Benjamin's Restaurant, and then when Benjamin's closed, it's been held at Segregancet Country Club for a few years. And unfortunately, COVID hit. And now this is our second year hosting virtually. Hopefully next year we can go back to holding this event in person. But I think I speak for everyone when I say we are once again looking forward to hearing from today's legislators and thank them for their time today. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Good morning, everyone. I'm John Moran from Bluestone Bank, and I'm a chairperson of the board for the Taunton Area Chamber of Commerce. Before we introduce our panelists, I'd like to invite Taunton Mayor Sean O'Connell to say a few words. Mayor O'Connell, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's great to see everyone today, whether it's in person or right here on Zoom. Uh, and thank you to Chris and Lisa, and of course the, the board of directors for organizing these updates. Um, it's a great way to get information and um, just have some time together. And of course, uh, thanks to our partners in the legislature for being here. Uh, once again, I get to be on the other side of the table and I have the easy job this morning of just welcoming everyone. Uh, but we do appreciate all of the things that our legislators do for us they can be instrumental in providing support and helping us in many ways, helping us you know, navigate barriers and challenges so that we can achieve our goals here in Taunton. And of course, thank you all, all the members for taking the time to attend this morning. Your uh, involvement and investment in our community is vital to our, to our success to our ability to achieve economic vitality and growth, uh, and also to ensuring a promising future for our city. Uh, we appreciate you and all that you do. Despite uh, COVID, in the last two years, we have seen businesses expand and open in all areas of our city as we're focused on all of our neighborhoods. And we have developers knocking on our door. So you are going to see a lot of progress on many fronts in the coming years here in our city. And I think, um, I think it's really fair to say that Taunton has fared well during the pandemic and as we emerge. I know it's been challenging for everyone, uh, you know, particularly our businesses and our families and our kids, but um, we fared well and we're emerging well due to you know, a number of things. Uh, number one, your perseverance and your support over the last two years, um, our strong community, the, the grants that we've created for businesses, organizations, uh, families in need and services for our children. And also due to, on the city side, being strategic in assuring that people have access to the vaccine and to testing with all of the clinics that we've set up and not imposing uh, unnecessary mandates that, you know, that hurt businesses and hold our community back. So we will continue to work nonstop to support 
our community and our businesses with creative solutions that will put us on the path to success and keep us on the path to success in 2022 and beyond. So thank you this morning for your time. And oh, I just wanna throw out one more thing. Everyone save the date. The mayor's ball is gonna be April 9th. So we're just getting our information out there. So we'll have information out soon, but I just wanted to give you guys the first heads up. Um, we had planned it in February, but had to postpone it. So now we're gonna have a spring mayor's ball on April 9th and I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor O'Connell. Um, I also want to acknowledge another local official who's uh, uh, just joining as an attendee today, but Dighton Town Administrator, Michael Mullen. So hi, Mike, Good and morning. thank you for being Hawaii, on the call today. You. Thank you. Now, John and I will introduce our distinguished guests. Please give a wave as we introduce you. Great. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, our first panel. John, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. As the body's longest continuously serving member, Senator Mark R. Pacheco has the honor as serving as the Dean of the Massachusetts Senate. He was elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives in 1988 and to the Massachusetts Senate in 1992 by the citizens of First Plymouth and the Bristol District. Senator Pacheco is the founding chair of the Standing Senate Committee on Global Warming and Climate Change and the Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on, on state administration and regulatory oversight. He was appointed by the Council of State Governments as the chair of the Eastern Region Conference's Energy and Environment, uh, Environment Committee. He also serves on the National Conference of State Legislators Task Force on Energy Supply. Senator Pacheco is the Senate Vice Chair of the Joint Committee on Telecommunications Utilities and Energy, and a member of the Joint Committee on Higher Education and the Joint Committee on Elder Affairs. You went mute again. Sorry about that, I don't know how that happened. Throughout his career, Senator Pacheco has supported initiatives to spur job creation and economic growth to preserve the environment and support the clean energy economy, to ensure the protection of the rights of veterans, women, and senior citizens, to increase civic engagement and foster the creation of global economic partnerships. He was selected by Al Gore in 2007 to become a climate leader, to increase the awareness around climate change and to encourage action to prevent its worst effects. He has prioritized these aforementioned issues of today to build a better future for the Commonwealth. Senator Pacheco, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Our next panelist is Representative Carol Doherty. Representative Doherty is a representative of the third Bristol District, Taunton and Easton, and is in her fifth and final term as a member of the Taunton School Committee. Her career as com uh, and community service has focused primarily on education. She was elected president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association, serving two consecutive terms. She was later appointed director of professional development in the School of Education at Northeastern University, where she remained for 18 years. In addition to serving on the school committee, her volunteer activities include co-hosting the Silver City Meeting House Radio Program on WBBF, a show dedicated to promoting civil dialogue on the issues facing our local community. Representative Doherty also serves on the Board of Directors of the Downtown Taunton Foundation and Triumph Inc., the community Head Start, our community's Head Start Early Childhood Initiative. Thank you, Representative Doherty, for joining us today. Thank you, now John. I'd like, oh. <laughs> now I'd like to turn it over to Chris and she'll introduce the next two panelists. Thank you. Um, Representative Patricia Haddad 
represents the fifth Bristol district, which includes the communities of Dighton, Somerset, Swansea, Taunton, and the southeastern part of the state, as we know. A member of the House since 2001, she has served on a variety of committees, including human services and elderly affairs, healthcare, Medicaid, natural resources and agriculture, rules, ethics, and ways and means. Haddad served two terms as chairwoman of the Joint Committee on Education, one term as second assistant majority leader, and five terms as speaker pro temp. Prior to her career in government, Pat was a health and physical education teacher in her native town of Somerset, where she also served on the Recreation Committee and chaired the Somerset School Committee. She's a member of the New England Board of Higher Education, South Coast Development Partnership Steering Committee, Advisory Committee of the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth Center for Policy, and is on the Neighborhood Corporation of Taunton. During her tenure in the Massachusetts House of Representatives, she has undertaken a number of assignments, including the Special Committee on Redistricting, the Legislative Commission on Public Housing, Special Task Force on the Economy and Economic Development, Legislative Commission on Middle Level Education and Council of State Governments slash Eastern Region Committee on Energy and the Environment. She has been honored by many groups and organizations, which include the Women of Achievement Award from the Miss Massachusetts Scholarship Pageant, Legislator of the Year Award from the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, Teacher Leader Award from the Reading Recovery Council of Massachusetts, Mass Bio Ed Award from the Massachusetts Bioeducation Association, and the Public Service Award from the Massachusetts Association of Chapter 766 Approved Schools. Representative Haddad holds an honorary doctorate of public administration from Massachusetts Maritime Academy and an honorary doctorate of public service from Bridgewater State University. In addition, she was named Bristol Community College's Distinguished Citizen of the Year. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Our last panelist today, not, but not least, Representative Norman Oral. He currently holds the 12th Bristol District seat to the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Now in his second term, Representative Oral continues to serve the citizens of Taunton and East Taunton, as well as the surrounding communities of Lakeville, Berkeley, and Middleborough. Throughout his time in office, he has proudly supported a variety of initiatives to sustain and expand the local economy around the Taunton area. Representative Oral is assigned as the ranking minority member for the Joint Committee on Environment, Natural Resources, and Agriculture, and additionally resides on the Joint Committee on Transportation, the Joint Committee on Municipalities and Regional Government, and the Joint Committee on Bonding and Capital Assets. While the representative is glad to be serving his state through these roles, his priority remains the well-being of his community. It is for this reason he is truly excited to be here today to speak with the Taunton Area Chamber of Commerce. So thank you very much for being here with us this morning. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator today. Bob Jacobs has been the president of TCAM TV since it began over 15 years ago. He has been a talk show host on radio and television for over a quarter of a century. Bob is a lifelong resident of the city of Taunton and was a small business owner for 13 years. Thank you so much for being our moderator today. Welcome, Bob Jacobs. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so let's begin. And I wanna welcome the panelists. Thank you for coming. Uh, and I'd like to start with opening remarks, uh, one minute each, if you would. And let's start with Carol Doherty. We're going alphabetically. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Bob. I appreciate that. Um, I'm so glad to be here. I have uh, uh, attended um, most of, if not all of the legislative discussions that the chamber has held. And I have to say hats off to you for maintaining the vibrancy of the chamber during some very difficult times. I also wanna say congratulations to those businesses who have kept moving forward during very difficult times, making sure that your doors, if they had to close, weren't closed very long took advantage of uh, opportunities to get grants and loans from federal, state, and from the city, as the mayor has pointed out, uh, and to just keep the ship rowing forward. I look forward to the discussion this morning, and um, I'll learn a lot more about you, and hopefully you'll learn a little bit about me as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Carol. Uh, let's follow up, Carol, with Representative Pat Haddad. Good morning, and, and thank you always for inviting me. Um, I will echo Carol's remarks, 
But I want to use my one minute to um, just tell you that um, many people said wind was not coming to Massachusetts. And I just want to tell you that there is a new company um, that will be coming to the South Coast. And they are promising 250 jobs starting at $70,000 a job. Um, they, are, they will be partnering with uh, Bristol Community College to make sure that those people are trained the way that um, uh, to be most useful. And um, I just think that we all we need to just continuously, as you have, um, seek business, keep business in, in business, and um, make sure that our area of the world is uh, is being looked at and, and uh, known for its ability to provide extremely competent, an extremely competent workforce. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing from you today also. And uh, that's my one minute. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, following Pat, we have Representative Norm Oral. Thank you, Bob. Uh, again, echoing my, my colleagues from the House, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, these are the type of events that we do look forward to because it is interaction. We get to learn uh, issues that maybe we hadn't heard yet. It gives you that opportunity to get us questions and, and so forth that we can help form uh, paths for you to move forward better as businesses. And we just thankful for the chamber to bring all of you together uh, to be a voice. Uh, it helps us. It helps, as Pat said, for us as a region to be strong, uh, to be continually looking out for our constituents, you know, your, your employees and all, you, all of you as well. Um, that's what we wanna see happen is a vibrant Southeastern Mass. It's been tough for the last few years, a lot of all kinds of things hitting us. And just now as we're looking forward to uh, recovering from, from one issue, we're, we're headstrong into, uh, into you know, global issues. So, um, we just look forward to doing the best we can and helping you thrive and helping our region thrive because that, that helps all of our families and workers thrive. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Norm. And last but not least on the one minute, uh, State Senator Mark Pacheco. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bob. And uh, through you to all the members of the chamber, to my uh, colleagues in the legislature, good morning. It's been a pleasure to be associated with the Chamber of Commerce over uh, decades now. I can remember going all the way back to Charlie Volkman, uh, working with him and Diana and in all of the you know, directors of the chamber, uh, all the small businesses that have been involved in working together to put together plans for the Miles Standish Park. Uh, which I've been proud to work with my colleagues in the legislature to uh, support, to make sure that we had the land necessary to develop economic opportunity for all the people in our region here in, uh, in Southeastern Massachusetts. As a small business owner myself, I understand how uh, problematic in and troubling it is uh, to try to conduct business uh, during this uh, pandemic that we've all been going through. It's been, it's been a significant challenge. And I understand uh, uh, the, the tumultuous uh, time that we have uh, been in the middle of in terms of just uh, uh, you know, working with your own employees, moving forward, trying to get that assistance, uh, trying to work through uh, different facets of what is taking place with unemployment insurance, which I see is a, is a question today that may come up, uh, you know, in terms of business loans, uh, uh, trying to get the necessary capital uh, to make it from, you know, one year into the next. Uh, so I have been a, a big supporter over the years, trying to make sure that we have the economic development, uh, you know, technologies in place uh, to make sure we have a, uh, a type of attitude that provides us with the opportunity to be successful. And I want to continue to do that along with my colleagues in the legislature 
I thank you for the invitation today, and I look forward to working with each and every one of you. Thank you, State Senator Mark Pacheco. Now, these questions uh, have all been fielded uh, from TACC membership, and uh, <clears throat> you've all been provided with these questions prior to this event. We're going to start uh, with uh, Representative Pat Haddad. And Pat, the question is, and we'll follow with everyone else on these questions. I ask you to keep, it, keep your answers concise because uh, of time constraints. The first question is, what are your feelings about Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito not running for re-election for a third term? Also, is there a particular candidate you would like to see fill these positions and why? And we'll start with Pat Haddad. Thank you. So um, I will just say that I think we have had a very strong working relationship with the Baker Polito administration on many, many things. And so um, I, but I understand that uh, their, this last term for them had to be um, grueling and almost impossible to, um, you know, maintain the kinds of responsibilities that they had. So um, I wish them very well in whatever their next uh, iteration of um, career will be. And as to, um, you know, I'll just say I'm with Maura Healy because um, I've known her for a very long time. Um, I feel that she has a handle on uh, statewide ability to uh, govern. And um, so that's as concise as I can be, you know, knowing her, knowing that uh, she will fight for the same kinds of things that are important to me, um, education, energy, uh, you know, making sure that uh, our constituents, which have been, uh, she's been the, the um, lawyer for all of the state, will be treated fairly. So I um, hope that's quick enough. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Haddad. Uh, next, Representative Oral. Thanks, Bob, and I'll keep it short too. Um, yeah, as far as feelings, um, it's been a, a great eight years, I think. Um, I myself had worked in, in the Baker administration for a couple of years at the start uh, as head of planning and engineering for the state park system, DCR. Uh, so I got to see internally uh, the high expectations his administration had uh, for making our state government and the executive level uh, work as well as it can. I think they did a lot to streamline uh, process, processes and, and uh, also be fair to the entire state. Um, I know that the administration paid attention to us. They've been to Taunton you know, multiple times. They've invested in Taunton. Maybe not every time we'd like, and there's a few issues we'd still like to, to get from them before, uh, before they leave office. Um, but in general, I think that was a hallmark of the administration was uh, equity within the entire Commonwealth and not just the power players in Boston. So I think that was a great benefit to us. So we'll miss him. I understand why he would uh, not seek a, 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 another term. But um, I think they will hold true to what they've said and try to finish strong uh, this last year. Is there a particular candidate uh, for governor that you're supporting? Or you'd not, like to not at this time, um, but I think uh, any candidate that I would be supporting would have to have that, you know, the same mindset of, of uh, looking at the entire Commonwealth and paying attention to us in the Southeast uh, of part of the state. So uh, I look forward to hearing from the various candidates as we get through this next election cycle. Thank you very much. State Senator Mark Pacheco, same question, please. Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, you know, I too have uh, in, uh, you know, working with the Baker Polito administration for uh, their whole time in office, uh, worked very closely with them on energy and uh, climate-related issues. Uh, we've had a, a very good relationship with the uh, Secretary of, uh, of Energy and Environmental Affairs, uh, Climate Katie, I like to call her. She was very 
very good at, at what she does. Uh, he, she, uh, the governor has appointed a number of professionals in the executive branch uh, uh, statewide. Uh, I have ha had some disagreements uh, with uh, uh, with the administration, in particular with the uh, Superior Court building in downtown Taunton, and why that's not completed, and trying to get that uh, that funding released. And we're continuing to talk about that. I was talking with the governor about that in Somerset the other day with Pat uh, at the event that uh, she referenced earlier about the company that's coming uh, to south southeast of Massachusetts as a result of uh, the work that uh, she and I and the Baker administration had worked on together in a bipartisan way. Uh, so uh, I've, I've been proud uh, to work with them on the issues that, uh, uh, that we've agreed on, and it have been many and have uh, have had fun uh, debating some of the issues that uh, we have uh, we have also disagreed on um, as far as a candidate running for governor that i may be supportive of as a democrat i'm also a supporter of maura healy i've worked with her for a long time and she would be the only candidate in this race uh, that would have represented uh, and worked to run a constitutional office uh, statewide. Uh, so she would not be walking in day one and uh, trying to figure out what to do. It's very complicated to run the executive branch of government. And uh, we're talking about uh, multi-layers of, uh, of bureaucracy uh, making sure you not only have the right people in place, but also understanding the roles of various uh, agencies. That's one of the things Charlie Baker had an advantage of coming in because it wasn't the first time for him working in the executive branch and doing this work. And so that's what I'm looking for in a gubernatorial candidate, somebody that can step in, walk in to the system and not lose a step for our economy uh, statewide. And, and that's why I think Maura would be, the, Maura Healy would be the best person to do so. Thank you, Senator Pacheco. Uh, up next, uh, Representative Carol Doherty. Oh, thank you. So I, I um, echo the sentiments of my colleagues in regard to the decision made by the Baker Polito administration not to move on for another term. Uh, for me, it was one of disappointment on those uh, rare occasions over the past um, year and a half since I have been a seated representative uh, to be in the company of that administration, particularly the governor, I found him to be just like talking to your neighbor, uh, very accessible, uh, very engaging, and easy to talk with. Of course, those conversations uh, by and large have been cordial without a lot of uh, heavy discussion on any particular issue, but nonetheless, a governor standing long enough with a freshman legislator to have a chat, uh, I thought uh, was going, going a long way. So it was one of disappointment that uh, they decided not to run. I have to uh, take my hat off to the administration around their effort through the Lieutenant Governor, as I understand it, I heard her uh, talk about that at the State of the State uh, message uh, a few weeks ago that they began this effort to really embrace communities, to bring them into the administration, make sure that communities were at the table when things were going on that uh, involved communities and kept that close relationship. And if you ever looked on at the daily schedule of the administration, you would see that uh, except for their meetings with the leadership in the legislature, they were always out in the communities for two and three places in a single day, uh, making sure that people in a particular community, whether it was around housing or education or any of those kinds of things that they were there uh, supporting community development, if you will, going forward. So um, I'm gonna miss his kind of boyish demeanor, I guess. And do you have uh, a particular candidate? That, uh, I do, it is uh, uh, of course, Maura Healy. 
um, I find her to as well to be engaging. She's calling around, I guess, all the legislators and really took the time. We were on the phone for a half an hour. My husband was chiming the conversation. And one of the things that I said to her was that please make sure not to leave southeastern Massachusetts behind. It's very, very important to have the presence of a candidate for governor uh, here with us so that we can engage that person or those persons uh, so that we can be sure that we're making the right choice. So I think that Maura Healy would make a forward-thinking visionary uh, governor for the Commonwealth. So thanks for asking, Bob. Thank you. Uh, my next question, and we'll start with Representative Oral. Uh, what can you tell us about the new small business grant funding programs allocated through mass growth capital? Well, thank you for the question. Um, and there's some folks on the line here that probably know a lot about it. Um, what I kind of are going back to the Baker administration, um, they've made it actually really easy um, to access grants. And right now, the, 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 the name of the game, uh, so, so to speak, of uh, you know, distributing, whether it's ARPA money or, or state funds, et cetera, is, is through the grant process. And they've really worked hard to streamline it. So what I would suggest to your members is get on the site. Um, the, the announcement just uh, earlier this week or last week of the, the 75 million, I believe it was for this particular uh, mass growth capital, it's, it's all there online and they've really made it easy to apply. And so that you can go in and check your particular circumstance and see if it, it, something that you would be able to benefit from. And, you know, between the business grants and the community grants, uh, I do think the administration's really made it easy to go online and find what you need uh, for communities. They've promoted, if I can just take a moment to sidestep to the community grants uh, and really have a one-stop location that you can go in and find what you need. But it's, it's similar for the, for the businesses. Uh, I know Secretary Keneally uh, and his team have really worked hard to make it easy for folks. So, um, it, and it does boil down to your particular circumstance. Hey, Carol, I'm not in. Leave a message. Hello. Uh, uh, we're we're going to, uh, same question to State Senator Mark Pacheco, please. Yeah, just to follow up on on uh, what Representative O'Rell said, it's a it's a essentially $75 million uh, small business loan fund, which has been established with uh, with APA funds, there, there's an inclusive grant program, which will provide a total of 50 million in direct grants to historically underserved uh, populations, including my, minority owned, women owned and veteran owned uh, small businesses. Uh, the new applicant grant program, which will distribute 25 million in direct grants uh, for nascent small businesses with priority given to new ventures and businesses that have yet to receive financial relief from our various uh, COVID-19 relief grant programs that we've had in the past. Uh, you know, just quickly, and you can get all this online, but the qualifying criteria uh, in include businesses that have two um, to 50 full-time equivalent employees, uh, a minimum of 40,000 in operating expenses, annual revenues between 40,000 to 2.5 million uh, has been uh, established before September 30th, uh, 2020. So all business meeting the program's criteria are eligible. However, the priority will be given uh, to those businesses that started after June 30th, 2019 and have not received federal or state or local COVID-19 program relief. Uh, so we're trying to actually go out and assist those businesses that did not have a shot at those funds uh, prior with the criteria that I, I, just, uh, I just cited. And again, as Representative Orell said, it's, uh, most of this information is online, but we're excited to uh, offer these options to small businesses in the, uh, in the region and statewide. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Carol Doherty, same question. 
Oh, thank you, Bob. So I, I, I won't uh, repeat the fine presentation made by my colleague, uh, Rep. Oral and Senator Pacheco. I will say that uh, I went and took a look at the governor's uh, budget uh, recommended for fiscal 23, and uh, there is a $40 million uh, appropriation. There's an annual appropriation for uh, those uh, grants and loans. It's, so it's funded by a, a, a budget appropriation as well as uh, the return of the loan money. So it makes uh, the bucket of money that's available. I'm, I'm more interested, and this may not be a good moment to um, learn about who on this call have uh, applied for those grant monies over the years and received them. Is, has there anyone who has, uh, who has done that? Maybe we'll, uh, maybe Chris will uh, see at if the, anyone. At the has end, it. I'd be just interested to see, and if there's a way that we can all as a delegation help to support your efforts to acquire those resources, we'd certainly be glad to do that. Thank you. And now we go to uh, Representative Pat Haddad. So, in the interest of time and, and not being repetitious, I will just say um, ditto to my colleagues, but I did give. Um, the website to Chris and she put it in the chat. And at, in that website, not only um, will you find the details, but you'll find eligibility and guidance as well on how to fill out the application. Um, and as uh, I, I just will repeat one thing that Rep. Oral said that I think is very important, that um, this administration has really made an effort to make these uh, programs easy to get to and um, with plenty of explanation. But I will say that um, if you have any issues, please don't hesitate to um, call my office because um, you know we're used to it and we'll, uh, we'll walk you through it. And I'll, I'll have Lisa put that number in the chat as well. Thank you, Representative. Um, again, I, I don't wanna say that we're gonna move to lightning rounds, but uh, I know it's difficult to sometimes answer these questions in a short period of time, but time is beginning to fly by. So if you could just be concise as you can, I would appreciate it. I'm sure the members would as well. Uh, on this question, I'm gonna start with State Senator Mark Pacheco. Uh, is there any legislation being discussed to address the labor shortage or supply chain issues that are greatly affecting the businesses of our <coughs> across the state. Uh, let me just say that at the end of 2021, because of a specific uh, section in the supply chain, uh, the uh, Senate passed legislation designed to ensure uh, more secure supply chain for egg and pork uh, purchases in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts by aligning our laws with the farm animal welfare standards uh, followed by uh, the critical supplier uh, states. Also in the beef industry, uh, we are looking at what's happening with the slaughterhouses. It's not something we think of normally in terms of uh, what takes place, but uh, uh, some of the big, uh, uh, big supply houses are uh, really, uh, you know, knocking a lot of the small, you know, uh, men and women owned uh, you know, companies out of the out of the supply chain, and that's becoming a problem. And we are we are looking at that. And while there are certainly opportunities uh, with regard to ongoing shortages uh, that we in the legislature are addressing and continue to investigate, uh, overall, unfortunately, this labor shortage is largely a result um, not only of you know the pandemic where people just decided, uh, you know, a lot of boomers out there decided this. They went to work one day and they got back and they just said, you know, we're, we're just resigning. We can make it. And uh, we're not, uh, we're not going to continue to uh, do what we've done in terms of the workforce. And there's been an underlying issue that nobody really talks about that much because it hasn't been brought up that much. And I mentioned this at the Middleborough Chamber uh, of commerce. And I want to mention it today because it's something that all of us are going to really need to really start to focus on. According to the CDC's National Center for Health Statistics, 3.6 million babies were born in uh, the U.S. in 2020, making a 4% uh, decline 
from the year before. And uh, that's happened for the sixth consecutive year of decline. Uh, you know, Pat, a dad and I serve on the New England Board of Higher Education. And uh, we just had a meeting the other day looking at college enrollments. And believe it or not, because of enrollment in higher ed has plummeted, you know, as, as well, we've seen uh, in 2020 and 2021, 3.1% decline in enrollment. We're looking at a 6.6 .6 or, or, or more than uh, a million, 205,600 fewer students since the fall of 2019. Well, fewer students, fewer high school graduates, right? Fewer people eligible to lure into various companies and businesses in the workforce. So the supply and demand uh, scenario around the workforce is really challenging now in the United States, across the entire country, and in Europe. That's where we're seeing declining enrollments. And that's why a national government has to get busy looking at a comprehensive immigration reform bill uh, to try to get us uh, uh, either that or uh, a lot of us, I, I, you know, and I'm not going to volunteer for this, but a lot, a lot of us have to get busy making some babies because we get a lot of, we've had a lot of uh, uh, challenges ahead of us uh, with the workforce when we have a declining percentage of people uh, okay, that are graduating you. high school. Uh, so it's uh, it's going to be a challenge. It's not the first thing everybody talks about, right? But it's the underlying problem that is there going forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, same question to Carol Doherty, please, if you have anything uh, to add to it, Carol. Uh, yes, thank you, ditto to uh, Senator Pacheco's remarks. And uh, I was delighted. I went. I filed a bill um, uh, to uh, put certified nursing assistants on a fast track for training and cer certification. We know that there has been uh, a crisis in the healthcare industry finding people at that level to take on those responsibilities. And I was delighted when I googled, just as you can, um, the MassLegislature.gov labor shortage uh, to discover that uh, the CNA bill, which I filed uh, along with Senator Chandler, um, is right at the top of the list. So that's just an example of the myriad of uh, training opportunities that uh, bills that reflect training opportunities uh, to try to help to solve the problem of the labor shortage. So there is a lot of activity and a lot of thought going on uh, right from the governor's level uh, to the uh, Senate and to the House. So we can be sure of that. There's also uh, a work workforce development money in the ARPA bill of um, and $150 million to enhance workforce training um, as well. So there's a lot of thought and concern going forward about the job market and what those jobs will be. Thank you very much, Carol. Pat Haddad? So I will just say that where we can, we are trying to have an effect. Um, this is a, there are, there need to be short-term answers to long-term issues. This has been going on for a long time in education. It's been going on for a long time in um, healthcare. And unfortunately, um, the COVID problems shined a light on many, many issues that have only been building. So uh, the short answer is we're doing our best, but it is, um, it's a long-term problem that <laughs> I will say to, as Mark said, it's bigger than just today. Um, and, and a lot of it has to do with population. Thank you. Representative Oral. Yes. And uh, in essence of time, uh, I think the Senator and, and my colleagues, Pat and Carol have kneeled down some of, some of the issues that just came around all at the same time, including uh, baby boomers retiring, uh, birth rates being down, and we've been seeing that through the years through the school systems with enrollments down. Uh, so the new workers coming in haven't been enough to replace those uh, retiring. Um, so it's difficult to legislate around that. Uh, the other issues, of course, we had were, was with the pandemic. Um, and kind of changing the landscape of the workforce. 
you know, those that had jobs that uh, could work remotely uh, certainly did well. And, and then I think even created some of the uh, economic boom that we had uh, because they had some spare money to, to spend from not commuting, et cetera. Um, and then uh, as workers in some of the lower wage jobs were laid off due to pandemic uh, regulations, um, they made different life choices and kind of looked at what they are doing. And uh, so it depends, I think, on the sector, uh, what the solutions may be. Um, and, you know, we, like as, as Pat just said, we do our best to, to see if there are ways we can, we can enhance that through legislation. But uh, personally, I do think, um, you know, we, we need to, to let the system work and, and, and hopefully we'll see, uh, again, if we weren't dealing with some of the international issues right now, I was prepared to come and say, I think we're looking at a positive uh, comeback on various issues. And as far as supply chain, you know, uh, the Senator mentioned, you know, some of the stuff we've done around ag. It was my pleasure to be on a conference committee hammering out the final details uh, for the uh, the bill I like to call the ham and egg bill uh, and saving breakfast uh, for uh, keeping uh, the supply of eggs and pork products coming. So uh, you never know what you'll do in the legislature is what I'm finding out. And uh, that certainly was one of the interesting things that we've done recently. But again, all to address supply chain and cost of living issues um, for our workers. So... Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to now switch it to one, one answer uh, for each question. Uh, and I'll be starting on this question with Carol Doherty. Next question, Representative Haddad. Next, uh, Representative Oral, and then uh, State Senator Mark Pacheco. And if you can please be as brief as possible with your answers, we're up against the clock. So for Carol, how might the Build Back Better funds be used to assist the business community? Well, we wish that the Build Back Better bill was passed by the Congress so that we could have the advantage of figuring out how to use those funds uh, for Massachusetts. But I think that, and I have a document, a three-page document that talks about what please the content... <laughs> what, what? No, oh, I'm you don't kidding. want me to read it? Oh, too no, much. please. But there, there's, it's a continuum of projects or programs that move toward enhancing business ultimately and the economy from childcare uh, to uh, higher education to climate change where lots of jobs would be produced to expanding housing opportunities to make housing more affordable, uh, to train America's workforce for the jobs of the future, uh, to provide more food. Uh, uh, so it, it goes on like that. And all of those issues really positively affect the quality of life of our, our uh, population and therefore enhances the business, uh, business community in the end. More job, childcare, more jobs, more money, more money flowing into businesses, uh, either in the form of hiring workers who are well-trained or selling products that are produced by those businesses. I think I would recommend if I were the president of the United States, not so, to break up this bill and take these issues up one at a time. It's not going anywhere at this point to my knowledge at the congressional level. So let's take up childcare or expanding housing and creating more affordable housing opportunities, for example, and do it that way. If you can't win it all, do it a piece at a time. Okay, thank you very much, Carol. And now next to Pat Haddad, uh, this question, is there movement on using any of the American Rescue Plan Act funds to shore up the unemployment insurance trust fund, which is very important to businesses, of course. Absolutely. So there's 350 billion available for state and local governments. Um, and the treasury has stated that they can be used to pay back unemployment insurance. Uh, but the states have until 2024 to make their um, decisions known and until 2026 to spend them. So what we did last year was that the um, Baker administration, we were to develop a plan to borrow um, up to 7 billion to replenish our unemployment insurance. And um, 
employers will be able to pay that back over the next 20 years, which will really lessen their uh, repayment burden. Um, but we're also looking to spend $1 billion of the state's surplus to wipe out debts from claims that came in um, last year. So we're still, it's still being discussed with the administration. Thank you very much. Representative Oral, this question is for you. Should public employees, meaning firefighters and police, be required to get vaccinated? How short an answer do you want? <laughs> No. What did you want? To <laughs> so, I, I say no. Uh, you know, it, it, this was one of the areas that I disagreed with the Baker administration on uh, from a statewide perspective, and that is yes, we want all of our workers vaccinated as much as possible. Um, but what I uh, was running into from constituents that were either in the state police, Department of Corrections, etc., um, it, it is. To me, there were people that were eventually fired and, and that, that, again, in a labor shortage that we got rid of that I, I, I believe we could have made accommodations for. And I think as we have been learning through the pandemic, um, you know, vaccines are absolutely critical, but to the point of firing someone, I disagree. I think that accommodations can be made just like they are uh, for any other health issue. Absolutely push as hard as you can to get people vaccinated. That I have no problem with, but I do think it goes a little too far when, when we mandate that uh, they either lose, that they lose their job. Because I, I just don't think it's consistent with how we treat our public employees in other health areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. State Senator Mark Pacheco, this question is for you. With all neighboring states approving sports betting, do you believe the Mass Legislature will finally legalize sports betting this year? Well, I hope so. Uh, I think uh, sports betting, we've lost uh, millions and millions of dollars uh, in, in tax revenue that could have been coming into the state of Massachusetts. And because of in action by the legislature, we have not seen uh, sports betting, uh, you know, uh, become a reality. And right here in southeastern Massachusetts, right up at the Rainham, uh, Rainham track, uh, uh, we would see uh, a whole sports betting pilot that could take place there, creating jobs in our region. And, you know, all of the jurisdictions all around us have it. Uh, and people uh, can sit home in their, in their home and, and, and actually go online and participate. So uh, the state is losing money every day. We do not do it. I can let you, I can tell you that as a legislator uh, representing this part of the state, I've been advocating for that and we'll continue to do so. And I'm disappointed that we have not uh, done so yet. Well, thank you, State Senator Mark Pacheco. Uh, I'm going to allow for uh, closing remarks uh, of 30 seconds, if you would, because we're right up against the clock. And um, let's see, who would be next? Uh, why don't you, Mark, since you're on the screen, why don't you give us closing remarks? Okay, well, let me thank you, Bob. And, you know, I just want to go back to one uh, thing that was mentioned earlier about the workforce, right? Workforce development it is the key to everything uh, as we move forward uh, to have a vibrant economy in Southeast Massachusetts, especially with some of the new jobs that will be created in the offshore wind industry. Uh, if we look at the trades, whether it's plumbers or electricians or carpenters or whatever it happens to be, you know, there's an there's a item that will be on the local ballot on Saturday that will be very important for the underlying economy in all of southeastern Massachusetts, and that's to make sure that the Bristol Plymouth Regional Vocational Technical School will be at the cutting edge as we move forward into the future, not only for the students that will be going to BPP, but also the adult community that is going back to school 
and uh, learning various trades, people that are shifting uh, their priorities in the, in the job market uh, to provide that opportunity. So I'd like to just use my closing uh, time here to say, I encourage everybody to go out and vote yes on that question. Those that uh, reside in Taunton, because it will help us with job training uh, and education here in southeastern Massachusetts, not only for the um, for the students that are at the high school level, but also the entire adult population within the region working with our uh, community colleges as well. Thank so you, that's uh, what I'd like to say. And I'd like to thank everybody for participating in, in giving us a, a few minutes of your time this morning. Much appreciated. Thank you, Senator Pacheco. Representative Carol Doherty, please. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much, uh, as I did at the beginning, for inviting me here. It's always an enjoyable experience. Uh, it is unfortunate that we went on and couldn't cover the rest of the questions because they grew increasingly more interesting as yeah, the list went on. So maybe we can take them up at the, uh, the next time uh, that we meet. Uh, I'd like to echo Senator Pacheco's uh, um, bid to go out and vote on uh, Saturday to support the construction of the new facility for the Bristol Plymouth kids. It will be a state-of-the-art facility and absolutely essential to have those state-of-the-art skills for our young people going out, in, going to college or going out into, into the workforce. Um, and just to say, uh, legislating is fun. Uh, it's difficult. The legislature moves with glacial speed. I once heard uh, one of my colleagues say of a bill that was put forward by the firefighters, it's only taken eight years for this bill to pass. So uh, are we successful? Sometimes, maybe, not always, but we never stop trying. And I think working together uh, makes it a better state, makes it a better quality of life for all people. So thank you for this opportunity. And I look forward to meeting you in person. Thank you, Representative. Um, next up would be Representative Pat Haddad. So also my, my great thanks for always being invited and uh, for the opportunity to speak with you. And I'll just reiterate that we are here to help. So um, please call, please reach out to our offices and anything that we can do um, to make your access or your uh, interactions with the state easier, we're here to do that. Thank, thank you. you, Representative. And finally, Representative Norm Oro. And thank you again. I echo my colleague's statements. And we, we're here for you. Uh, we're, we're disappointed we didn't have enough time to get through all your questions, but continue them coming to us. You can always pick up a phone or send us an email and we'd be glad um, to help you or to answer questions or just kind of, you know, if you've got suggestions for us for what legislation would help. So we, and I, I really, as I always say, appreciate this delegation. Um, um, I'm honored to be a part of it. And I think we really work uh, well for you and for the region. So we, uh, we thank you for sending us to, to the state house to do your work. Well, thank you. Thank you to all of the elected officials and thank you to the TACC for allowing me the honor of being the moderator for this event. Chris, it's back to you. Thank you, Bob. Great job keeping this thing moving. We really appreciate it. I feel like we could be here for another hour though with uh, the questions uh, from our members and thank you all for submitting those. Um, thank you to my co-host, John Moran. Thank you again to the officials and Mayor O'Connell for joining us. Thank you all for attending. We had a great turnout today and I can't wait to do this next year in person with everyone. We do have two in-person events coming up an after hours in April on the 13th and an after hours in May on the 25th. So please turn out for that and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much.